And it is the Saturday Coffee Clutch uh, with Heather Lofthouse and yours truly. Uh, and today, a special guest, uh, because, you know, this past week, the Consumer Price Index came out, out, and everybody is kind of, everybody I talk with is worried about inflation, or at least uh, still the, the kind of tenacity of inflation, especially with regard to grocery prices. And so we are so delighted to have as a special guest today as somebody who knows more about not only grocery prices, but groceries and food and nutrition than anybody else maybe in the world, Michael Pollan. Let me introduce Michael very, very quickly. Michael, you probably all know, is the author of The Omnivore's Dilemma, How to Change Your Mind, The Botany of Desire, many other books. Michael, I love your books. And... Uh, uh, and also, he and Eric Schlosser uh, just, uh, are just out with a new documentary uh, called Food, Inc. 2, uh, which explains how giant corporations have taken over what we eat. Let's get into it. Michael, welcome. What is the Thank story? You. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Heather. Yeah. What is the story with food and prices? Well, I think what we're seeing is the result of a uh, insufficiently competitive marketplace. Um, you know, in the last several years, the food industry has been consolidated. We saw this during the pandemic when the food system essentially fell apart. And one of the reasons is there are too few players, and, uh, and especially in the grocery area. And although the Biden administration has stopped one very important and would have been disastrous merger of Kroger and Albertsons, which represents basically every, you know, you don't know them by that name, but those companies own virtually every supermarket chain you've ever visited. Um, but what's the incentive to bring down your prices if you're in a, a monopoly or an oligopoly situation? Uh, there's no one trying to undercut you. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons prices have not subsided. Uh, you know, during the during the pandemic, it was supply chain disruptions um, that helped drive up prices. But the persistence, I think, owes to the lack of competition in this marketplace. Michael, is a competition a, a problem not only in the grocery uh, kind of retail area, but how much of it is a competition in terms of food processors uh, yeah. and uh, and all the way back even to to the seed corn uh, that farmers get. And the, yeah, and the, you know, the ranchers deal with this. Uh, people raising chickens and pigs deal with this. What happens is, see, I think, we, I think we've developed a very narrow understanding of the purpose of antitrust. Uh, generally, we, we've been taught to think of it as a matter of consumers, uh, you know, are hurt when companies combine. And that is true, but so are producers. So right now, if you're, let's say you're raising cattle in, you know, I don't know, in Vail, South Dakota, some corner of South Dakota, um, there are only four companies buying 86% of the cattle in this country. And they've pretty much divided up the country regionally. So you may only have one person to sell to. And you know what happens when that's the case? You have to essentially take the price they're offering. And so many farmers have become price takers. And this is true if you're, if you're raising corn or soybeans. Um, you, you, you can't negotiate. Uh, these are kind of set prices, and they're set by Cargill and ADM and these giant companies. Um, so it's, it's really a dysfunctional marketplace. And if you go back to the history of antitrust, it was very much about producers and protecting them from uh, from uh, companies that were, you know, essentially uh, destroying their marketplace. The word consumer doesn't even appear in the Sharon Antitrust, Sherman Antitrust Act. Uh, the focus was very much on producers. And the third factor, which I think is perhaps the most important, is do you want these concentration of powers in your politics? Um, do you want to have so much power in a company like Tyson, for example, which is the largest meat packer in this country, that during the pandemic, they could actually force the hand of the president, uh, this is Trump, and get him to sign uh, an executive order invoking the Defense Production Act to reopen their lines after the public, local public health authorities had deemed them uh, vectors of COVID into their community. 
that's a that's a company that's got way too much power. The Defense Production Act is designed to get companies to do things they don't want to do, uh, like you know uh, a car manufacturer being forced to make tanks or airplanes for a war effort. That's that's why we have it. But in this case, it was invoked to allow Tyson to do exactly what they wanted to do, which was open their production lines. Michael, you know, antitrust is something that uh, I used to spend a lot of time in and with. Uh, I know. And, I can't uh, believe I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm telling you about oh, it. I learned no, a lot no, of what I this, <laughs> this, is, this is very important. But my point is that before Robert Bork uh, became as dominant a force in conservative circles as he did, antitrust was still being enforced. Uh, but after Robert Bork's ideology uh, was was accepted by the Reagan administration, it became the dominant force even during Democratic administrations. I mean, it's not just Trump and George W. Uh, it's also Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. Uh, and uh, and I, but but Biden marks a a real difference in terms of going after some of these, you mentioned uh, Kroger and Tyson, uh, Kroger and Albertsons, uh, but I, I think the Biden administration is really uh, trying to revive antitrust. The question is whether it's too late. Yeah, well, that is the question. So the, the change you're talking about that was uh, engineered by, or the ideology was Robert Bork's, was only a memo in the Justice Department. There was never a change in law. And it was any Democratic president could have simply discarded it or written a new memo on the standards for antitrust. Biden is the first president to do that. He has actually discarded uh, that standard and invoked a new one. And that's a huge deal. And he deserves a lot of credit for it um, because, does. yes, it's not easy. He is up against some very powerful forces. Uh, we, we've lost the habit of enforcing antitrust in this country. And part uh, of it isn't part of it the judges. I mean, the judiciary, uh, which is now, I mean, George W. Bush uh, and uh, some of his some of his allies really did change uh, the court system. And a lot of the judges don't really appreciate the points you made that antitrust is not about consumer or at least solely about consumer welfare. It's about politics and it's also about uh, sort of the, uh, you know, uh, the, the producers of the ultimate, yeah. you know, the people who are out there. Small and farmers. I don't think they've, they've figured out how to message this yet correctly. I mean, there's still talk. I mean, I was looking at the Apple suit, uh, which, you know, was filed a couple of weeks ago. And they still talk mostly about the, produ about the consumer and a choice for the consumer, which is, again, important. But in the case of Apple, it's these producers, these people making apps and, and other forms of software that can't, you know, are forced to go through the Apple store and pay this, you know, exorbitant 30 percent tax on whatever income they make. So I think they're, the administration is doing some very important work, but they need to learn how to talk about it. Yeah. Well, they, that's a big, yeah. they, they have to take a page from Teddy Roosevelt, <laughs> right? And um, uh, and 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 develop a, a kind of a grassroots support for these efforts, which which doesn't yet exist. One and that's, that's that's always risky. Yeah. So first of all, thank you for bringing your coffee today. I see your espresso cup, and we have to say that only four companies are responsible for fifty percent of coffee in the U.S. While we're talking about food monopolies which is incredible. Um, I think it's important to note, too, that for a while, and you mentioned the pandemic, Michael, and how this idea of price gouging um, has evolved over time. But this was kind of fringe for a while when we, Bob, other people were saying, hello, corporations. But now last month, the FTC came out with a big report that yeah. says expansion to profits is driving this inflation. It is the profit margin. It's not somewhere down the supply chain. It is an active choice. And so there is, and the mainstream media wasn't talking about this, it's getting a little more traction, but it's taken a long time, right? Speaking of messaging. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think you'll be hearing more about it from the administration as we move into campaign season. Um, but I think they've got a legit case to make yeah. um, that this is price gouging. And, um, and you know, it makes a difference if they jawbone about it. It yeah. could. Yeah. I and mean, I think they should. And and even if it doesn't, people will understand and stop blaming the Biden administration for this, uh, for something that they didn't cause. That's it. One other thing I saw just yesterday, Hormel, 11 million bucks it has to pay in a class action suit for 
allegedly price gouging. Just yesterday, another one. I missed that. You know, that's interesting, Heather. I, I, didn't, I did not see that. But I, I was also interested in Michael's point about consumerism kind of pushing out, uh, even in the messaging of the Biden administration, uh, who we are as citizens. Uh, and also pushing out the producers. I, I mean, you know, if you look at the agriculture sector of this economy, uh, it used to be that most people in America, at the turn of the last century, were involved in agriculture. Now, small farmers are obviously much, much smaller, but still we have a place in our hearts for small farmers and family farms, uh, but it's all kind of corporate agriculture now, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, as prices have been forced down by the buyers of these agricultural commodities, the, the business strategy of the farmer is get bigger. It's the only way. You know, farmers think in terms of cash flow, not profits. They often make no profits. They often uh, supplement their income off farm. Um, and most of the farmers I know in the Midwest have another job, basically. But they have to buy up the land or rent the land from their neighbors, and they get bigger and bigger. And this hollows out rural America. And this is part of the anger that is emanating from rural America. John Tester in Food, Inc. talks about this, you know, that his town, you know, used to have uh, four hardware stores. Now it has one. Used to have three bars. Now it has one. Um, and it's just, and I remember when I was reporting from Iowa that it took something like six high schools to field, six, re, you know, town high schools to field a single football team. Right. Um, there's nobody home. And there's a lot of anger about this. And I think some of it, though, has fallen on the Democrats because during the Obama administration, at the beginning, he made a lot of noise about antitrust in ag. And he sent his attorney general and his secretary of agriculture out having a listening tour. Farmers stood up in public and talked about how they were being um, essentially exploited by this or that company, whether it was the seed industry or buying cattle or pigs. Uh, and then after the, the midterm, that first midterm where he got shellacked, as he famously said, and was accused of being anti-business, he simply dropped the antitrust initiative. And we heard nothing more for six years. Remember, Obama won Iowa twice. That is just inconceivable today. Totally inconceivable. Win Iowa. Totally. But that's one of the reasons. I think, I think he, he raised expectations and then dashed them. Well, you know, I, the, the question there, interestingly, is why? I mean, in 2015, uh, I don't know if you and I have ever talked about this, Michael. I was out uh, in Missouri talking to farmers, uh, doing a kind of free-floating focus group, some research I was doing. Uh, and I asked them, this was 2015. This was when Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush were the putative uh, right. front runners for their parties. Uh, and I asked these farmers, uh, you know, who are you really interested in or who might you be interested in for president? And many of them said, uh, well, there are two people we're interested in. One is uh, named Bernie Sanders and the other is Donald Trump. And I kept... Mm -hmm. I kept saying, what? I mean, these are two people who are on the opposite extremes of America. But what these farmers, and I kept on hearing it from actually more and more people uh, in the farm belt and in even uh, the rust belt, uh, more and more people kept on saying, well, we want a, a, a fundamental change because the game is rigged against us. And that's what I, that's the yeah. issue. And it still is. It's really rigged against them. And that's one of the themes of this film. And John Tester speaks to it. You know, he's a real crusader for antitrust enforcement. And, you know, he's up for re-election in a state where I think Trump won by 40 percent. But he but he has a shot. Um, I mean, he's very popular. And um, he was fantastic in the film, as was Cory Booker, who was in it. And you yeah. all what I think it's so beautiful and it's right now it's on demand. We can all be watching it again is this the showing of what you're saying right now, right? So we get all these stories, they're beautiful motion graphics, and they're these people like Fran Marion is one of the fast food workers, one of these farmers, one of the people on the front line who are being impacted by these big corporations. And it really is glorious storytelling with real people. Um, well, you know, Fran, the story of Fran is incredibly moving. And she's a an really eloquent spokesman for all the people who are feeding us at fast food outlets, who are, um, you know, have an average wage of like $15,000 a year, um, who many of whom are on public assistance. 
So, you know, what does that mean? That means your tax dollars are going to subsidize McDonald's and Walmart because they can't pay, they don't pay their employees a living wage. So they need they need to be on food snaps, uh, food stamps. They need to be on, you know, all sorts of form, whatever forms of public, uh, you know, Medicaid and everything. Um, you know, we're going to see a very interesting experiment in California, which is just uh, uh, put in place a $20 minimum wage. Um, for, fast, for fast food Fast food workers. workers. And, you know, it may, it may help people remember again the old Fordist idea that if you pay your workers well, they'll buy more of your products. Um, so, right. So they're, they're, they're kicking and screaming about this, but we'll see how it actually pans out. But... You know, the workers of these companies, too, are having their wages forced down by concentration because yeah. you don't have a lot of choices. If you if you work in that industry, you know, you're going to get the same pay at McDonald's as you're going to get at Wendy's. Right. So, Michael, where is all the money going? That is, we have, uh, you know, fast food workers and farm workers and f small farmers uh, and consumers all paying more and getting less. So there are bigger and bigger profits, and who gets the profits? Where are the profits in agriculture, in food, in our entire food chain? Where are they ending up? Well, I assume a lot of them are going to shareholders in these companies. A lot of the companies are public, but not all of them. Uh, Cargill is a private company, uh, the biggest in the world. Um, so we don't know exactly what's happening to those profits. But they are making record profits. There's no question. And um, so it goes to and it also goes to their um, their executives, you know, who make um, uh, Eric Schlosser did some calculations and for uh, a fast food worker to make as much as the president of McDonald's, you know, 15,000, he makes 15,000, I think, every minute or every 10 minutes. I forget exactly the figure, but I mean, the disparity, we've never had disparities like this. Um, so that's where a lot of it's going. Um, the executives are paying themselves handsome salaries and the, and the stockholders are doing pretty well too. Yeah, the executive pay uh, in, 19, in the 1960s was 20 times the typical worker in America. Now it's 350 times the oh. typical worker in America. Uh, but it's also the shareholders, you know, we, that we have a delusion that somehow many Americans have shares of stock directly or indirectly. Uh, but if you look at the data, you see that the richest 1% have about 52% of all shares of stock. Uh, in the United States. The richest 10% have 93% of all shares of stock uh, in terms of value. Uh, so uh, the, the richer the shareholders get, uh, the, the more lopsided the allocation of income and ultimately wealth becomes. Uh, but Michael, let me, let me get back to uh, workers for a second, because I take it that as you see more and more concentration uh, in this, in the food sector or in America, a lot of workers have less choice of whom to work for so that they are like any other producers. They are being shafted by a system that makes it more, harder for them to uh, achieve upward mobility. Yeah, no, they're in the same boat as uh, all the their producers themselves, as you suggest, and they they too have lost that ability to sell their time in a competitive marketplace. Uh, and, you know, this is what capitalism is supposed to be about, competition. But it turns out corporations hate competition. <laughs> and, and, and anything they can do to stop it, they will do. Right. And that's why we have antitrust laws. So this reminds me, too, of a quote you said in the movie, Fooding 2, which was, the logic of capitalism and the logic of nature are at war. So we've talked about how monopoly power is taking away from our freedoms, our being consumers, workers. But what about the environment? Can you talk a little bit about that? We haven't talked about it. Yeah, well, you know, as you move toward consolidation, you have, I mentioned farms getting bigger and bigger, feedlots getting bigger and bigger. They're feedlots now with 100,000 head of cattle. Um, this is the equivalent of a city of several million people in terms of the amount of waste that's produced. But unlike cities that under the Clean Water Act are forced to clean up their waste, feedlots are exempt. They can just leave it in big lagoons or spray it on the earth or whatever they want to do. 
There are enormous sources of, of water pollution and air pollution. Iowa now has the second highest cancer rates in the U.S. That's a new wow. thing. And that coincides with the rise of these um, uh, pig feedlots, uh, indoor pig agriculture, um, and also nitrates in the water. Um, most people in Iowa are drinking water that's been polluted by agricultural chemicals. And the result is very high rates of cancer. So, you know, the politics that we're seeing makes more sense when you realize how many people feel, as Bob said earlier, that the game is rigged against them. Because it is. That's not an inaccurate uh, perception. Um, the environmental costs of agriculture are enormous. About a third of greenhouse gases can be traced to the, to the entire food system. Um, it happens at every level. Um, but the, the most important level, in my view, is one we don't talk about very much, which is the excess use of nitrogen fertilizer on our cornfields. You know, corn is the great American crop. We grow more of it than anything else. We grow so much of it, we can't get rid of it fast enough. So we feed it to our cars in the form of ethanol, which offers no environmental benefit. Um, and then we, you know, process the hell out of it to create these ultra-processed foods that are very profitable. Um, but what happens with nitrogen fertilizer is Farmers put on, by, by most estimates, twice as much as they need or as their plants need. And they, they, if you ask a farmer, they say, well, it's crop insurance. Um, they put on more, and that'll guarantee that they get maximum yield out of their cornfields. The problem is that any nitrogen that's not taken up by the plant gets wet when it rains and turns into nitrous oxide, which is a very serious greenhouse gas right. comparable to methane. Um, so... That's uh, when, when Walmart did a life cycle assessment of its carbon footprint, trying to figure out how they could limit their uh, greenhouse gas production. You know, you would have thought it was their big box stores that are air conditioned and heated or their global supply chain. In fact, the biggest contributor from Wal of Walmart's to greenhouse gas production was the nitrogen spread on the corn plants at the base of their food chain. Wow. That grows all the high fructose corn syrup and the feed for the meat. And um, so there's a lot that could be done to mitigate the, uh, the carbon footprint of agriculture, and, but we're not doing much of it. And one other note on that is it is highly subsidized by the government corn, right? Yes, it is. We, um, we, we encourage farmers to grow maximum amounts of corn and soybeans. We ensure them so that right. even if they plant it in regions where it doesn't do well, where there's not enough rain, we'll cover it if, it, if their crop fails. But yes, um, we heavily subsidize corn and soy production because it is at the base of the food system. We do not subsidize what the USDA calls specialty crops which is their euphemism for actual food that you can eat. Um, and uh, we do very little for those crops. And of course, that's exactly what Americans should be eating more of. Um, our, our agricultural policies are not organized around maximizing health or the health of the environment. They're, it's just about lowering food prices by overproduction. Michael, a lot of people who are watching this or listening to this uh, podcast are probably saying to themselves, uh, well, what, what's the way out of this? I mean, if, if, I mean well, you said that Walmart uh, had done an assessment of its environmental impacts and public health impacts. Uh, we've talked about the concentration of industry. Walmart is, is a good example. Well, what's, who is taking action other than antitrust? The Biden administration is doing a little bit. Uh, but w what's the answer here? What can the average person do about the uh, big agriculture and, and all of the problems that are flowing right now from big agriculture? Well, there's a lot, I think, that the average consumer who is acting as a citizen, and because and, those two identities can be joined, um, and that we have seen, and this is one of the more hopeful uh, dimensions of the food issue that I've been involved with for so many uh, years, is that consumers can vote with their forks and they can they can opt out of the industrial food system they can buy local produce they can buy local meat um, you know I think not patronizing feedlots is a good start um, both for your health and for the health of the um, the animals and um, and the producers um, so that's one thing 
The other thing, though, that I think is encouraging is that there are now some powerful people in Congress who get this, who have connected the dots around the food system and its impact on our health and, our, and, the, and the health of the environment. Uh, the two we feature in the film are, are John Tester, who needs help with his re-election, um, who's a key player in driving um, support for antitrust enforcement, and Cory Booker. Um, his decision to use his political capital to get, uh, get himself on the Agriculture Committee is very important. We need more people on the Ag Committees who represent eaters, not big farm state uh, legislators, which is basically, you know, it's been a backwater for anyone from a city um, since the 60s. And Cory Booker, like, gets it, that the health of his constituents, he doesn't come from a big farm state, although there's some, you know, perfectly nice tomato farms in, uh, in New Jersey. Um, but he gets that the health of his constituents, and we haven't talked about public health very much, but you know, we have 40% obesity in this country. We have um, outrageous rates of diabetes. Um, and this is all connected to the diet. I don't know that people realize, but the leading cause of death in America is no longer smoking. It's, it's diseases linked to diet. And Booker gets this. So, so one thing to do is to support the legislators who get it. Um, and there are people in the House and people in the Senate who finally do. Um, and the other thing is, you know, I'm optimistic that in a second Biden administration, um, the gloves will be off in terms of antitrust. Um, from, re from rear lips to yes. God's ears, let's hope. I am an optimist. I mean, they're really up against it. And um, one of the things you learn when you go to Washington, and I'm sure, Bob, you observe this yourself, and I just did this week because we had this premiere in Washington for the film, is that all the politicians look to us for support, that they can't do it on their own. They're, they, they're up against very powerful corporate interests, and they need to hear from the grassroots. Uh, they need that protection. And I heard this from people at the FDA, I heard it from people at the White House, and I heard it from Booker and Tester. Um, so citizen action on these questions is, is really important. So you need to vote with your votes and vote with your forks. Well, Michael, on that upbeat note, uh, I'm going to tell people they can uh, not only see the film, uh, it's on demand right now, uh, but we're going to play a clip of your film. Thank you so much, Michael Pollan, for joining us. Everybody out there, uh, cups up, <laughs> uh, eat well, sleep well, have a great week. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Heather. Over the last two decades, something called the food movement got started. But the food industry is dominated by a handful of very powerful companies. So there's a lot at stake when you sit down to eat. When the pandemic hit, the curtain was peeled back. There were whole crops being buried. At the same time, there were shortages in the supermarket. But that's not the only problem. Working in the fields, our work is essential, but we as people were treated as disposable. How could I go to work for these billion dollar companies and feed all these people all to come home to hear my son's stomach growl? By fixing our food system, we will create health and well-being in every aspect of our lives. And I want rural America to be vibrant again. That's my motivation here. They're going to say, we're not going to let some big mouth senator from Montana stop us. And so, bring it on, guys. Every one of our oysters filters 50 gallons of water a day. And our kelp soaks up five times more carbon than land-based plants. This is solar powered, electrically driven, on a programmable basis. You're dealing with a crowd that does not like change. When you walk into a supermarket, there's a whole arsenal of additives designed to mislead the brain, actually interfering with the brain's and the body's ability to metabolize food. I sure as heck don't want my tax dollars subsidizing the things that are making people sick. Now, what are the proteins that you're producing? That's something we, we can't talk about on camera right now. I wanted to wake up in the morning believing what I was doing. This is wealth right here. Programs like ours demonstrate the kind of policy change that we want to see. This is our chance to chart a new course. I want to see people living life, not just fighting to survive. 
Just imagine if the government decided to step in on the side of the consumer and the citizen. We not only can do it, we have to.